the Hello everyone. Tonight we are gathered in a clearing in the heart of an enchanted forest and we have many stories to listen to and things to discover. So without further ado, let's begin with the first story, one from Ireland that was put in writing in the Middle Ages, but appeared centuries earlier. The story of Deirdre of the Sorrows. Once upon a time, The king ruled over Ulster. His name was Crehur Magnesa, Crehur son of Ness. And at his court, Awin Macha lived the royal storyteller, the royal bard, Fermin Magdol. One day, Fermid had a daughter, Deirdre, and as usual for newborns, Prophecies were made. The chief druid prophesied that Deirdre would grow up to be a very beautiful woman, one whose charm would be almost irresistible, but that much blood would be shed because of her. Kings and lords would go to war, and the greatest warriors of Ulster would be forced into exile for her sake. The prophecy terrified the court, and many urged Felmid the Bard to kill the baby before it became a reality. Felmid didn't know what to do, but the king chose for him. The announcement that Deirdre would be one of the most desirable women in the world had aroused him. So he decided to keep the child for himself. He would let her grow up and marry her later, when she would be of age. Crehur, the king, guided by lust, hid Deirdre. The infant was entrusted to a poet, a wise woman, who lived in seclusion in the woodland and never received any visitors. Her name was Lower Ham. Away from the court and society, only in the company of Lower Ham, Deirdre grew up happily, and the first part of the prophecy seemed to become reality. As years passed, she turned into a beautiful child, and then a delicate and irresistible young woman. One day in the winter, As an immaculate blanket of snow covered the forest, Deirdre saw a raven landing in the snow with its prey and was ravished by the colors. She told Lower Ham that one day she would love a man with the same colors she had seen, hair as dark as the raven, skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. Lower Ham had become very attached to Deirdre, that she now regarded as her daughter. After all these years, when the joy and affection of the girl had softened her lonely existence. So she told Deirdre that the man she described existed. She was describing Nisha, a handsome young hunter, warrior, and singer, who lived at Awin Macha at the court of King Crehur. Disobeying the orders of the king, the old woman helped her young protege to meet the man of her dreams. As soon as Deirdre and Nisha met, they fell in love and realized that life would be meaningless if they couldn't spend it together. 
Nishak would count on his two brothers. Together they were the three greatest warriors of Ulster. And together they made plans to escape the country and travel to Scotland, where Nisha and Deirdre would be able to live together, far from the reach of King Creur. And so it was done. The four escaped on a boat, and soon reached Scotland. They lived a happy life there. They fished and hunted to eat. They saw magnificent places. And this simple life was enough to fulfill their dreams of happiness, because love and the joy of being together nourished them every minute of every hour of every day. They didn't think about it, but the prophecy had said, when Deirdre was born, that the greatest warriors of Ulster would be forced into exile, and so it had happened. Back at the court of Ulster, the king had been humiliated, and his fury did not diminish. So he resolved to take revenge and get back the woman he had decided would be his. He sent a loyal courtier with an invitation to return for the three brothers and Deirdre and a promise of safe return home. The brothers had not forgotten their sense of duty despite their exile to Scotland and they accepted the offer, confident that the king would not dare make prisoner or harm people he had invited personally. How wrong they were. Because Crehul's anger had made him forget honesty and the laws of hospitality. As the news of their return reached Ulster, the king sent Loerham, the old woman who had raised Deirdre, spy on the travelers, with the mission to tell him whether Deirdre's beauty was still intact. The woman tried to protect Deirdre, and came back reporting that her protégé had aged and was now ugly. But it was a lie. Deirdre's beauty had only bloomed during her stay in Scotland, and the king knew it, because he didn't trust the old woman, and had sent another spy to check on her. Deirdre, Nisha, and his two brothers were lodging at a house that the king sent his soldiers to attack with orders to bring Deirdre back alive. The following day, as the king's troops attacked their refuge, the three brothers fought with all their strength, and many of their enemies died. The prophecy had announced that much blood would be shed because of Deirdre, and much blood was shed this day even though it was lust and anger from the king that were responsible. Despite their bravery and their strength, Nisha and his brothers could not contain an entire army, and they indeed overwhelmed. Nisha was killed by a spear, and his brothers shortly after him. After the death of Nisha and the capture of Deirdre, Crehur took her as his wife. Deirdre's body was still alive, but something was dead inside her. Something had died with her only love. Silent and sad, she let each day pass without noticing the heat or the cold, the joy or the sadness of others around her, and weeks, 
made of days that felt all the same, past, then month, made of weeks that felt all the same too. After a year, Krahur could no longer bear Deirdre's coldness and contempt that reminded him every day of what he had done and prevented him from enjoying the company of his wife. All the more that sorrow only enhanced her beauty and made her more attractive than ever. He asked her who she hated the most in the world besides him, and she said it was the man who had killed Nisha with his spear. Krahul replied that he would then give her to this man, so that he would be freed from her, and she would pay the price of her coldness. As she was being taken to her future spouse on a chariot, the king taunted her. This was more than she could bear, and so she threw herself from the chariot against a rock, finally finding deliverance through death. Deirdre was no more. The curse of her beauty was finally accomplished. I told you earlier that this story is from Ireland. It is taken from the Ulster Cycle, one of several cycles of Irish heroic legends. There are four main ones, and the Ulster Cycle alone comprises 80 different stories. And Irish mythology is only one aspect of Celtic mythology. There was a time when Celtic peoples covered a large part of Europe, from Eastern Europe to Spain and Great Britain and Ireland. So who were the Celts? What happened to them? What did they believe in? What gods? What myths? How did this heritage reach us or get lost sometimes? These are some of the topics we will touch on tonight. And of course there will be many more stories from the mythology of Celtic nations, where this cultural heritage lasted longer and had much influence in Scotland, Ireland, Wales, parts of England like Cornwall, Brittany in the west of France. We have a lot of things to discuss, so I suggest you make yourself comfortable. As always, you can follow the story just by listening. If you decide to close your eyes, your imagination will work for you and help take you away from the worries, concerns and thoughts that keep you awake. So allow yourself a moment of escapism and discovery in the Celtic forests of the past. If you fall asleep, you will be able to resume the story where you left it, using the timestamps in the first command. In the same command, which is pinned, you will find links to listen to my stories on audio streaming services, if this is more convenient for you, and also a link to my Patreon page if you feel inspired to support me there. You are now more than 500 patrons funding this channel, so that it remains free of video ads for everyone. And if you become a patron, you can download the stories as audios or videos, listen to them as podcasts, participate in surveys to choose future topics, and get information regularly about what comes next on my channel. But now is story time. 
So let's return to our topic and more Celtic stories. So what is Celtic mythology? It is almost as if there were several, because the religions and beliefs of the Celts were not unified, and in some regions they lasted much longer than in others. The golden age of the Celts across Europe was during the Iron Age in the first millennium BC. The Celts were a collection of peoples with languages that were apparented and many common cultural traits. They descended from migrants that had arrived centuries earlier from the East. They were one of these numerous waves of Indo-European peoples that are believed to have spread from Ukraine and the north of the Caucasus to uh, all of Europe and as far south as Persia and India. The cradle of their specific European culture, at least the most ancient parts of it, that archaeology has revealed, was in a large region that went through the east of France, the south of Germany, Austria and Hungary. But over several centuries they expanded as far east as Romania and even the center of Anatolia in modern Turkey, and as far west as Spain, Portugal, Great Britain and Ireland. In the first centuries of Rome, the Roman Republic was under a serious threat from the Celts installed in the north of Italy. But after a peak by the middle of the first millennium BC, the cultural area of the Celts began to shrink. They were faced with two main competitors for space. From the east came another Indo-European group, Germanic peoples, who progressively advanced towards the west, reaching the Rhine River and Scandinavia. In all the previously Celt regions east of the Rhine, Celtic culture was replaced with Germanic culture. And the second threat came from the south. The expansion of Rome to Spain, France, Belgium, Great Britain also shrank considerably the regions dominated by Celtic peoples. They stayed where their ancestors had lived for generations, but their culture did not always resist the might of Rome. Beside its military and economic might, Rome was also a cultural power that transformed the societies it conquered. So, about 2,000 years ago, after the Germanic and the Roman wave of expansion, the areas where Celtic culture remained dominant were limited to the fringes of Europe or the margins of the Roman Empire. Scotland in the north of Great Britain, Wales that was occupied by the Romans, but where Romanization was not as intense as uh, in England or in Spain, in Gaul. The language and many traditions survived three centuries of occupation. Some parts of England, like Cornwall and Ireland, that remained free of Roman presence. The Celtic area re-expanded a bit later with the migration of Celtic Britons, especially to the south, to the region of Brittany, but we will return to that a bit later. Speaking of Ireland, let's dive into another story from the Ulster Cycle for now. 
the story of Kuhalin, a legendary demigod, the son of Lug, a god from the Tuatha Danann. We will talk about it later too. And a mortal. His mother was Derchne, the sister of the king of Elster, Kreur Magnesa, that we have just seen as the villain in the story of Deirdre. The life of Kuchelin was filled with extraordinary deeds and miracles, starting with his birth. There are several versions of it, but here is one. His mother, Derchne, was the sister of the king of Ulster, and one day she accompanied him and a group of nobles to hunt a flock of magical birds. But snow began to fall, and they had to look for shelter. They found a house nearby, where only a couple lived, and the woman was pregnant, about to give birth. On the night of their arrival, she did, she gave birth, and Derchne assisted in the birth. It was a baby boy. In the barn near the house, a mare also gave birth to twin colts. The Ulster men camped around the house that could not accommodate them all. But on the next morning, when everyone woke up, the house and the barn had disappeared, and their occupants were nowhere to be found. Only the child and the colts remained. This was obviously magic at work. Maybe a divine intervention, and the boy could not be abandoned. So Derchne took him home and began raising him as her own. But the boy fell ill shortly after, and he died. As Derchne was mourning the child, the god Lug appeared to her and revealed that he was their host that night. He had seen how she had started raising the child, and decided that she should be the mother of his son. He also told her that he had already placed his child in her womb, and that she should call him Setanta when he would be born. Then Lug disappeared, leaving Derchne to her dismay. Months passed, and the belly of Derchne betrayed her pregnancy more and more each day, which turned into a scandal, as she was promised, but not yet married, to a warrior of the court. Derchne explained herself, revealing the nature of the child she was carrying, and the entire court of Ulster, Awin Macha, was filled with wonder. When Derchne gave birth to the child, he was named Setanta, as ordered by Lug, and the nobles of Ulster argued for the honor of being his foster father, the dispute was settled by deciding that several of them would be foster parents, so that the miraculous child would be the son of the entire Awin Mara. The king himself and several other noblemen and women who would teach him judgment, eloquent speech, morals, poetry and arts provide for him and nurse him until he would become the extraordinary hero he was promised to be. Several years passed, and Setanta grew up. He became a healthy and brave child. 
There was a group of children at Awinmacha, a boy troop that played and trained together. And even though he was still a small child, Setanta begged his foster parents to join them. But he didn't know that the custom was for newcomers to ask for the boy's protection before joining the group. And he ran onto the playing field without asking. The boys took this as a challenge and attacked him. He seemed to stand no chance against a dozen boys older than him. But as they started fighting, he suddenly had a battle frenzy and bet them all single-handedly. King Krahur arrived and put a stop to the fight. He cleared the misunderstanding and Setanta accepted to ask for the boy's protection. Not that he needed it, apparently. But as soon as he got it, he began to chase after them, demanding they all put themselves under his protection. Revealing that not only was he an extraordinary fighter, he also had innate authority and leadership. Rahur had noted the boy's exploits and kept an appreciative and protecting eye on him. It happened one day that a smith called Kalan invited the king to a feast at his house. Before going, the king went to the playing field where the boys were playing the traditional game of hurling. He was so impressed by Setanta's performance on the field that he asked him to join him at the feast when the game would be over. Setanta agreed and the king went to Cullen's house. But he forgot to tell his host that the boy would arrive later. And as all the guests had arrived, Karen let loose his hound to protect the house. The hound was enormous and ferocious, so much so that the whole neighborhood was afraid of him and would never have approached the house when it was guarding it. But Setanta couldn't notice, and when he arrived at the house to join the feast as ordered by the king, the beast attacked him, a beast three times heavier than him, with powerful jaws and big teeth. A fight ensued, and Setanta had to kill the hound in self-defense. Everyone in the house was alarmed by the noise, and when they exited, they saw the dead hound and understood what had happened. Cullen was devastated by the loss of his hound, so Setanta promised he would find a replacement, and until the puppy would be old enough to do the job, he would guard Cullen's house himself. And so it was done. From this moment on, the druids decided that Setanta's name would now be Ku Khalin, Cullen's hound. In another episode of Ku Khalin's childhood, it happened one day at Awin Macha, that the young boy overheard the druid teaching his pupils. One of them had asked what that particular day was auspicious for, and the druid was now making a prophecy. He answered that 
any warrior who would take arms this day would accomplish such deeds that he would gain everlasting fame. Kuchelin was only seven, but the promise of everlasting fame and extraordinary accomplishments seduced him immediately. He went to the king and asked for arms. He was given several weapons, but none of them could withstand his strength so that at the end, the king himself gave him his own weapons, which were the finest and strongest of Ulster, and they were perfect for Kurlin. But as they were conversing, the druid arrived and grieved, because he had not finished his prophecy when Kurlin had run to the king. The warrior who took arms that day would indeed be famous forever, but his life would be short, and so it became clear to all that Kuchelin would be a hero, but that his fate would probably be tragic. But the boy was still young, and not the kind to be discouraged by the sayings of an old man. Soon afterwards, upset by the way people kept talking about this prophecy at Awinmacha, he asked the king for a chariot. Time had come to accomplish great deeds. He set off on a foray and attacked three brothers, three warriors, enemies of the kingdom of Elster who used to boast that they had killed more Ulster men than anyone else. He entered in one of his battle rages and easily defeated his enemies. But then he returned to Awinmacha, to the court of Ulster, still in this state of battle frenzy. He didn't know friends or foes, when he was in this rage, and the Ulster men were afraid that he would slaughter them all. By chance, the queen, who led the women at Awinmacha, had an idea. She ordered the women to bare their breasts to him. This unexpected but arousing display caught Kuralindai and he was distracted. The Ulster men took the opportunity to wrestle him into a barrel of cold water. But the heat from his body was such that the barrel exploded in a cloud of steam. They put him in a second barrel, and this time the water only boiled and then a third barrel, and this time the water only warmed to a pleasant temperature. The crisis was averted for now. Before we go on with the story of Kuchelin, let's take a look at the connection between Irish, Scottish or Welsh mythology with their Celtic roots, and why it is mainly through them that we have access to stories that were sometimes born more than 2,000 years ago. For the Celts in close contact with Rome, and where the empire stayed in place for longer, their myths and religion did not survive this period of several centuries. The ancient Celtic religion was abandoned, and the knowledge of the mythology from Spain or Gaul is known mainly through contemporary Roman and Christian sources, but there are very few. 
as I said before, only a few Celtic peoples maintained their linguistic identity and their political independence. The Gaels in Ireland and Scotland, the Welsh in Wales, and the Celtic Britons of southern England. Later, many Britons crossed the Channel to Brittany in the west of France and revived culture in Brittany against the general trend of weakening of Celtic culture. It is in these regions of Europe that Celtic culture and mythology lived on for several more centuries and left a, a much stronger trace. But the ancient Celtic religion was finally almost erased in the Middle Ages by Christianization. And paradoxically, some of these nations that adopted Christianity later than many other parts of Europe became intensely Christian. Ireland or Brittany became strongholds of Christianity in the Middle Ages. Celtic culture did not entirely disappear, of course. It remained in languages, in tales, in folklore. But the old religion was pretty much erased. Erased but not entirely forgotten. Because the Middle Ages is the period when this agonizing ancestral mythology was put in writing for a large part by monks, and a lot of precious information was preserved and transmitted this way. Centuries kept passing, and along the Middle Ages these nations generally maintained their independence. Scotland, Ireland, even though it was not unified, and Brittany, the exception politically being Wales, that was attached politically to England in the Middle Ages, but always kept the sense of its individuality. In the Renaissance and the modern times, however, these small nations fell into the orbit of their bigger neighbors, and they lost their independence. Brittany was annexed by France in the 16th century. Scotland shared kings with England until the Acts of Union in 1707 that created a single kingdom of Great Britain, an island that also was in a personal union with England since the 16th century. They had the same sovereign, joined Great Britain in 1801. These unions were always faced with local resistance from part of the population. But if you had asked a Scot, an Irishman or a French citizen of Brittany what their identity was 200 years ago, they would never have said they were from a Celtic nation. The Celtic period was little known almost entirely forgotten across the population, and it was not a meaningful political reference at the time. There was of course a sense of identity and difference based on the language, based on traditions, a long history of independence, but what people had in mind was history since the Middle Ages. The antiquity or the pre-Christian period was not important. It was little known, vaguely barbaric and pagan, so nothing to be proud of or build a respectable identity on in societies at the time that were still very Christian. The folklore, the tales that were told and passed from one generation to the next, were very much alive and a part of people's lives. They still contained a lot of Celtic pre-Christian elements. 
but these were not necessarily distinguished from later editions. And then came the 19th century and the Celtic revival, a renewed interest in national history that happened in pretty much all European countries. There was a Norse or Viking revival, a Germanic revival, and a Celtic revival. The curiosity of scholars and the public for pre-Christian and pre-Roman times increased dramatically. Archaeology, languages, myths and legends, it all became much more popular. And a part of the national identity in many European countries became linked to these ancestors and their culture which was technically accurate, but also a choice, because there were other possible ancestors from before. The Celts had the advantage of being better known, this was very important as a factor, and having lived long enough in these lands to be considered like the founding people. It was also very useful, politically, to create a sense of national unity, and the governments did not discourage and often promoted this way of telling a national history. This was when the French started to be taught in schools that their ancestors, for example, were the Gauls. So, regarding the Celtic aspects, of these 19th century revivals. This is when the various nations or regions that consider themselves Celtic today began to adopt the term. A century earlier, they wouldn't have, and the Celtic revival changed their own perception of their history. It is a chosen identity, but one that makes sense because indeed there is a major Celtic heritage that is not just based on DNA. The local languages, the folklore, the names of places, the historical roots of this sense of a national identity that distinguishes them from their neighbors. This all can be traced back to the Celtic period. Now, one difficulty when it comes to the sources of mythology is to distinguish what is from the original body of myth and religious beliefs that the ancient Celts had, and what has been added later by Roman or Christian authors who put mythology in writing. In popular culture, things can easily get mixed up. One example of this is the Celtic cross. This cross featuring a ring that unites its four branches. It is quite ancient. It appeared in the early Middle Ages in Ireland, Great Britain and France. But it appeared as a Christian symbol. There is no example of crosses like this made by the Celts before their conversion to Christianity. They used symbols like circles with branches that could possibly have inspired Celtic crosses, but all the high crosses that can be seen across Celtic regions date from the Middle Ages or after 1850 with the Celtic revival. And yet, many people believe that these crosses are ancient Celtic symbols. They can be called symbols of Celtic Christianity, but not of ancient Celtic paganism. The same for stone circles, the most famous being Stonehenge, but there are plenty across Western France, Great Britain, Spain or Ireland. Celt Druids may have used these circles, but they date from before the Celtic period. They are actually way older. I'll 
put a link in the description to the video about Stonehenge. So, even though details may have been changed, and time probably altered them, the stories that were written in the Middle Ages in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, parts of England, and Brittany, are the closest things we have at our disposal to original Celtic myths. I told you earlier that the Ulster Cycle contained 80 different stories, but it is only a part, a section of Irish mythology, one that centers on the north of Ireland. There is also the Fenian Cycle, or Finn Cycle, that centers on a hero called Finn McCool, and the group of his warriors, the Fianna. There is another set of tales about the Tua de Danan, the group of godlike peoples said to have arrived into Ireland in ancestral times. This one is called the Mythological Cycle. Yet another division is the Cycles of the Kings, that contain stories of legendary kings of Ireland. A lot of this Irish mythology is shared with Scotland, and actually in multiple stories characters travel between them, and apart from Ireland and Scotland, there are Welsh, Cornish and Breton mythology, which share stories or details with them, but are independent bodies in their own right, that we won't have time to examine tonight, but I would be happy to make another video at some point about these specific mythologies. This abundance contrasts with continental Celtic mythology, apart from Brittany. This was entirely lost. From Gaul or Spain, we know close to nothing of the myths that were transmitted by the oral tradition, and pretty much all we have is the name of several gods that were worshipped either across the Celtic world or locally. So now let's take a look at what we know of these deities and the Celtic pantheon. Among the gods and goddesses that transcended tribal boundaries and regions, there were a few notable ones. The Matras, Kernanos, Taranis, the Sky God, or Epona, the Horse Goddess. They were probably known under different names, depending on the regions, but traces of their cult have been found across the ancient Celtic world. The Matras were female deities, were shipped in northwestern Europe. They were always depicted in groups of three. Their function is little known, but they had a large following that coexisted with the Roman gods during the first centuries in Gaul or northern Italy. Interestingly, this motif of tribal goddesses was very widespread in ancient Europe. The Romans had uh, the Parci, the female personifications of destiny. The Greeks had the three fates. The Norse had the Norns, always going by three. In Irish mythology there is the Morrigan, we will talk about this tribal goddess later. It is believed that this tribal goddesses motif has an Indo-European origin, because all these peoples were Indo-Europeans. Kernanos is another well-known figure. The name serves for many examples of probably the same god with antlers. Kernanos was depicted sitting cross-legged and usually holding a torque 
that is to say, a large, rigid or stiff necklace. Kernanos was venerated intensely across Gaul and Spain, and probably had a, at least an equivalent in Great Britain and Ireland. But his precise identity or significance in ancient Celtic religion are unknown. It has been supposed that he could have been a god of animals, of nature and fertility. Taranis was the god of the sky and of thunder, and apart from Gaul and Britain and Ireland too, Traces of his cult from before the Germanic migration have been found far to the east, along the Danube River. In Gaul, he was syncretized, that is to say, merged or associated with Jupiter, the Roman god. And Tyrannus was referred to by Roman authors as part of a triad of major Gallic gods, the two others being Essus and Tutatis. Tutatis' cult was widespread in Gaul and Britain, and it seems he was a protector god that tribes invoked to defend themselves from foes or disasters. And finally, another goddess worshipped throughout the Celtic world was Epona, a goddess protector of horses and associated with fertility. Contrary to other Celtic gods that stayed local after the Roman invasion and saw their influence diminish, Epona had some success abroad. Her cult spread to other parts of the Roman Empire. She even had a cult in Rome. The lands occupied by the Celts also had one or several healing deities each, often associated with thermal springs. Belenus in northern Italy and Gaul, Borvo in parts of Portugal, Brig or Brigid in Ireland. She was a goddess of fire and light, but in some stories is presented or intervenes to heal warriors. In Great Britain, a lot of wells were dedicated to a goddess that the Romans called Minerva, but that was certainly not how the Celts called her. In the city of Bath, the goddess associated with the thermal spring was called Sulis. This is an example of a local deity. There were hundreds, if not thousands of them, and the cult of Sulis merged with that of Minerva in the, the Romano-British period. Other gods were associated with the sun, Lug, the father of Cúchelin, in the story we began before. But also in Ireland, a goddess called Green, and yet another called Aine, Belenos in Gaul. The truth is that it is very hard, if possible, to understand precisely what deities were associated with across the Celtic world, which was diverse and Probably that no one could have a precise understanding of various pantheons in each region, even at the time. In total, the Celts may have had thousands of gods. For most of them, their names are not even known, and will probably stay forgotten because no one ever wrote them. But we are going to see some of these gods and goddesses intervene in their Irish iteration along the story of Cúchelin. So let's resume it. We had left Cúchelin as a child, after the prophecy that announced his fate and 
his first martial exploit. Several years had passed, and Kuchelin had become handsome as he turned from child to man. So handsome, actually, that the Ulster men worried that without a wife of his own, he would probably soon steal their wives and compromise their daughters. So they searched all over Ireland for a suitable wife for him. But he had already set his eyes on Emma, an exquisite young beauty he had fallen in love with. Her beauty was stunning, but so were her gentle voice, her sweet words, and her wisdom. The only problem was that her father was against the match. His older daughter, Emma's sister, was still unmarried, and it would have been improper to marry the younger daughter first. He also argued that Kurlin needed to accomplish deeds worthy of Hammer's perfection. In reality, he hoped to gain time. These were only excuses, because his real intentions were to find a better match for his daughter, like the King of Munster. So he declared that before any marriage could be discussed, Kurelin should go train in arms to Scotland. In Scotland, more precisely at Dunska, the fortress of shadows on the Isle of Skye and its wild mountains plunging into the sea, lived Skarar, a renowned warrior woman. She was an expert warrior that no man could vanquish, and it was said that few came back alive from Dunska, from her fortress of shadows on the Isle of Sky. The father of Emmer hoped Kurelin would not survive the ordeal and never come back. On the Isle of Sky, Skarar taught Kurelin the arts of war, and he also made a good friend. Ferdid, who also trained at the Fortress of Shadows. Our hero finally returned from Scotland, fully trained, but again, and this time with no argument left, Emma's father refused to grant her daughter's hand. This was enough. Kuralin, now stronger than ever, stormed the fortress, killing everyone on his path, and fled with Emma to bring her back to Awin Maha. In the following years, Kuchelin had more adventures. He rescued a Scandinavian princess, avenged a friend, but when he reached seventeen, the time for his most famous exploit had come. Hoin Bukulnia, the cattle raid of Kuli. To the southwest of Ulster was a hostile kingdom, Connacht, and on its throne was Maeve, an ambitious and mighty warrior queen. Maeve was a personal enemy and former wife of Crehur Magnessa, the king of Ulster, and for some time she had planned to attack Ulster. She coveted in particular a bull called Don Kulnia, an extraordinary stud that could reproduce fast and was a source of prestige and wealth for his owner. But the bull belonged to Hulster, and she decided to steal it. Kuchelin was supposed to watch the frontier, and the simple thought of it made all Hulster men feel safe. But it happened one day that he neglected his duty 
to spend the day with a woman. He loved Emma, but it didn't stop him from seducing others. The curse disabled all the men of Ulster, suddenly. And Maeve started her invasion plan by sending an army across the frontier. Kuralin realized the price of his negligence and ran to the frontier on a mission to single-handedly stop the army of Connacht. His strength was formidable, but no match for an entire army, and he had to employ ruse. He invoked the right of single combat. Two champions would fight, one for each side, and the battle would be over when one of the sides would be left without a champion. Being the only warrior for Ulster, Kuchelin would have to find the entire army of Maeve, but one by one. He knew he could easily win each fight, at least until he would be exhausted. But the task would be formidable, enormous, as there were thousands on the other side. The men from Connacht followed the rules of honor and couldn't deny the request. And so began the first duels. Kuchelin won fight after fight, and days passed that turned into weeks. Queen Maeve saw her army slowly bleed, and the bull still hadn't been stolen. But Kuralin also had to face another dangerous opponent while containing the army of Connacht. One day, between two fights, a beautiful young woman came to him and claimed to be the daughter of a king who had come to offer him love. Focused on his task, and remembering why he was not on the frontier on the day of the invasion, he refused. Hearing this, the woman revealed herself as the Morrigan, the Phantom Queen, who was one and three at the same time, in revenge for the rejection she had suffered, she intervened in his next fight against yet another warrior from Connacht, and she intervened under three different forms, first as an eel, then as a wolf, and finally as a cow, but each time Kuchelin wounded her, and she had to retreat. More days passed, and Kuchelin's strength was abandoning him. After one particularly arduous combat, he lied, severely wounded, and wondered if he was going to lose, leaving Ulster and its bull at the mercy of his enemies. At this moment, the god Lug appeared to him and revealed he was his father. He also healed him and encouraged him to triumph. The night passed, and when Kuchelin woke up, he realized that during his sleep, the army of Connacht had been attacked. The men of Ulster were still neutralized by the curse. But not the boys, and the boy troop from Awin Macha, of which he once was a member, had attacked the army. The poor boys didn't stand a chance, and had all been slaughtered. Seeing this, he was taken by one of his battle frenzies, the most spectacular yet. 
He didn't just fight faster and stronger than ever. A metamorphosis took place, and he shifted into a monstrous thing, hideous and shapeless, that attacked the entire army of Connacht at once. He killed hundreds that day. Not enough to vanquish Maeve, but sufficiently to shake her allies. Once he had returned to his human shape, the combats resumed. For three days, he had to fight a grueling duel with his best friend, Ferdid, who he had met on the Isle of Skye. But Ferdid fought on the other side, on the side of Connacht. He finally won, but this victory only had the sad taste of his tears. During all these weeks, the curse that paralyzed the men of Ulster had slowly lost its power. And, one by one, then in groups, Ulster men were converging towards the battlefield that Kuchelin had been controlling for so long. The final battle was near. And again, thanks to the intervention of their hero, Ulster men were victorious. Maeve retreated, and against all odds, Ulster emerged victorious of the cattle raid of Cooley. More adventures awaited, and there was still the prophecy that Cúchelin would be at the same time forever famous for his deeds, but would die young. But not tonight. On this victory and this day of triumph for Ulster, we will leave our hero to let him rest and maybe we will return to the rest of his miraculous life and other stories from Irish mythology another time. Hello everyone, please join me around the campfire, because tonight we are going to explore a world of gods, heroes and monsters, in the forests, the fjords and on the cold waters of northern seas. The time has come to tell you about North mythology. But let's begin immediately with the first story, and there will be many more. We will go back and forth, and I'll tell you about the history of the gods, the cosmology, the myth of creation, many different aspects of Norse mythology. This first story is about the king of gods, Odin and how he lost an eye. Odin was the ruler of the Aesir tribe of the Aetis, an all-powerful clan that included Thor, Tyr, Loki, Baldur or Heimdall, and many more. Their home was Asgard, one of the nine worlds, and the highest of these nine worlds, because all the worlds were located on the branches of the world tree, and Asgard was on the highest and sunniest branch. But Odin was not the kind of almighty warrior that ruled by pure physical strength, like Thor. He was also an avid seeker of knowledge. He did not always play by the rules of honor or justice, and he was as much into poetry 
and a quest for wisdom as he was into a triumph on the battlefield. He often left Asgard to wander through the cosmos and pursue his own goals. His thirst for knowledge and for discovery was such that he was willing to sacrifice almost anything to it. And this is how he was able to discover the secret of the runes. At the center of the cosmos was the world tree, Yggdrasil, that supported the nine worlds on its branches. Yggdrasil grew out of an infinitely deep pool, the well of Erd, and the mysterious depth of the pool held many of the most powerful beings and forces of the cosmos, so mysterious and secret that they were unknown to the gods of Asgard themselves. Among these beings were three maidens, the Norns, who created the fates of all beings. They shaped fates by carving magical symbols, the runes, into Yggdrasil's trunk, and these intentions traveled throughout the tree by the power of these runes, reaching the worlds and individuals they were destined to. Everyone and everything in the nine worlds, up to Asgard on top of the tree, was affected by the power of the Nords and their runes. From his throne, Odin observed the three maidens and his will to appropriate their power and their wisdom only grew day after day. He became so obsessed that no sacrifice seemed too big to complete this task. But the runes did not reveal themselves to any but those who were worthy of seeing them, those who had proven their absence of fear. And Odin could not see them, he had to prove his worth. So he hung himself from a branch of Yggdrasil, he pierced himself with his spear, and from this terribly precarious position, he scanned the dark waters below him. He had forbidden any other god to help him, because this would have invalidated his attempt at showing he was willing to sacrifice himself, and that he feared nothing on his quest to discover the runes. He stared and stared into the waters, staying on the edge that separates the living from the dead. After one day, he still hadn't seen the runes. Another day passed, then several more, and the runes still refused to reveal themselves. But at the end of the ninth day, as his last forces were vanishing without bending his will, he began to perceive shapes in the depth of the pool. The runes had finally accepted the proof of his fearlessness, they had accepted his sacrifice, and they began to show themselves to him. They did not only reveal their shapes, they also let him see and learn the secrets that lied within them beyond their physical form. Odin quickly fixed this new knowledge in his memory that knew no limit, and ended his ordeal by climbing on the rope he had used to hang himself. He could then return to Asgard and heal his wounds. Odin had now acquired the power of the runes, which turned him into one of the mightiest beings in the universe. And he liked that, 
because his thirst for power was as great as his curiosity for knowledge. Armed with the knowledge of the runes, he could now protect himself and his friends in battles. He could wake the dead. He could render his enemy's weapons useless, magically put out fires, or heal any wound, physical or emotional. Odin was satisfied, but he never had enough. And on another occasion, he proved again his willingness to sacrifice himself to acquire knowledge. At the base of Yggdrasil, amongst the roots of the world tree, lived an exceptionally wise being called Mimir, who sometimes advised the gods. Mimir's knowledge of all things was unmatched, including by Odin himself, and he achieved this extraordinary understanding of everything by drinking water from a well. The water came from the well of Erd, the same pool from which Yggdrasil grew, and where Odin had seen the runes for the first time. So this water was not ordinary. It contained all cosmic knowledge, and this knowledge could be absorbed by those who drank it. Odin climbed down the tree, all the way down from Asgard to the roots, with the intention of asking Mimir for a drink from this miraculous water. But Mimir knew the value of even a few droplets of this sacred water, and he refused, unless Odin accepted to sacrifice one of his eyes in return. It was one thing to risk his life to discover the runes, but the certainty of losing one eye against the mere promise of extended knowledge was yet another commitment. But Odin cared more about acquiring knowledge than his physical integrity, and he opted to accept the sacrifice. He took one of his eyes out and dropped it into the well. Mimir kept his promise. He dipped a horn into the well and offered Odin a drink of his water. From this moment on, Odin became the one-eyed god. He didn't lose his eye on a battlefield or a heroic fight against a monster, like some people would think for a god of war. He sacrificed it to acquire something much more precious than honor or respect in his view, wisdom and knowledge. As you know, mythological tales are always open to interpretation. And there can be many, because they often exist in several different versions, with alterations. Apart from the simple pleasure of storytelling, or their religious significance, myths always serve as a reference in the cultures where they appear. They can be cautionary tales, explanations about the origins of the world, or why it is as it is. They also have a political dimension. But one problem with Norse mythology is that there is not an abundance of documents, of texts, to refer to. Contrary to other ancient cultures like China, India, ancient Egypt or Greece. In contrast, Norse mythology is known mainly through medieval texts. The most important ones are called the Eddas, we will return to them later. And apart from texts, there are remains of oral traditions and archaeology. And all the important texts are from the last generations, when Scandinavia and Iceland 
were in the process of being converted to Christianity, and the old religion, the old cosmology and all the beliefs that came with it were in the process of disappearing. The texts are from these last generations or even after the massive conversion to Christianity. But before we take a look at these sources and their historical significance and the people who developed these myths, a branch of Germanic peoples, the Vikings, I'm going to tell you about these nine worlds that were said to be supported by Yggdrasil, the world tree. There's a lot to tell, a lot of things to discuss. So before we begin our exploration of the nine worlds, make yourself comfortable. I already told you about Asgard, the land of the Aesir gods. There were other gods too, the Vanir, and they once were at war with the Aesir. This will be another story for later. These nine worlds were not easy to travel to by any means. They were generally invisible, and only secret doors led to them. Only the world of humanity, Midgard, was visible. But the eight other worlds could at time connect with the visible world. For example, Jotunheim, the world of the giants, could overlap with the wilderness in our world. Or Hell, the underworld, could connect with graves, or Asgard with the sky. The number nine came back a lot in North mythology, as well as other Germanic people's myths which were closely apparented. It is unknown exactly why. It could be that the lunar calendar had 27 days, a multiple of nine, but there is no final explanation to their fascination for this number. The positions of the worlds, shown at different levels around the trunk of the world tree, are also speculative. These are modern depictions, because nothing in the sources show these nine worlds physically placed around a giant tree on branches. It could have been a metaphor or a symbol, because it doesn't really fit with the existence of overlaps between them. When accounts locate Asgard in the sky, this is probably more spiritual or symbolic than physical. Asgard is first and foremost the land, the enclosure of the Aesir gods, the most famous and probably the most important deities for the Vikings in their daily lives. They were the ones praised as models and worshipped for all sorts of favors. Asgard was almost always presented as a model of order and civilization. Ancient Germanic peoples had the concepts of Inangard and Utangard. What was Inangard, literally inside the fence, was orderly and law-abiding, stable. What was Utangard, outside or beyond the fence, was wild and chaotic. These concepts applied not only to geography or to these mythical worlds, it also applied to uh, the psyche, to thoughts, to actions. They could be either in and guard and uh, well thought out, rational and justified, or out and guard, disorderly and anarchic. Asgard was the representation of the Inangard, the model of orderly perfection. Another world, Jotunheim, the homeland of the giants, was the exact opposite, 
the model of Utangard with its chaos and uh, unpredictability. And between the two, somewhere in the middle with uh, elements of both law and civilization, but also chaos and wilderness, stood our world, Midgard, the middle enclosure, or middle land. Before we talk about Midgard, here is a story about how Asgard was fortified. There was a time when the palace of the Aesir gods in Asgard was defenseless, and this was a concern for Odin. One day, a certain smith arrived at Asgard and offered to build the gods a high wall that would protect them against even formidable enemies. The smith said that he could complete the task rapidly in only three seasons, but he also understood that the gods had no alternative if they wanted their wall. So he asked for an exorbitant price. He would build the wall against the hand of the delightful goddess Freya, the goddess of love and beauty, plus the sun and the moon. It was certainly in Odin's power to grant the three, but was it worth it? The gods took counsel. From the start, Freya was against these terms, as her fate was at stake. But the other gods really wanted their wall, and thought that there would always be time to rediscuss the terms later. One of them, Loki, came up with a plan. He suggested the builder should be granted what he wished, but only if he could complete his work in a single winter instead of three seasons with no help from anyone but his horse. The gods didn't really want to grant him the sun or the moon, and even less Freya's hand, but they found the plan perfect, because there was no way the smith could build a wall so fast. So he would fail to deliver it so quickly, and they wouldn't have to pay him anything. To their satisfaction, the builder agreed to the new terms, on the condition that all the gods swore oath to keep their promise. And so it was done. The builder began working on the wall. At first, the gods marveled at how fast the wall was rising, and how thick it was. The horse hauled enormous boulders over huge distances, night and day, and the builder piled them up so precisely and strongly that this wall would certainly be able to discourage any enemy. But as the winter progressed, their marvel turned to concern, and then alarm. The wall was closer to be complete every day, and at this pace, the builder would be able to claim his prize. When the end of the winter was only three days ahead, only the stones around the gate had yet to be put in place, the builder would most probably succeed. The gods' fear and anger at being so close to being tricked turned against Loki, the instigator of the plan. They threatened him, said he would be responsible for the loss of the sun and the moon, which would plunge the nine worlds into darkness, and for the horrible fate of the delightful Freya, who would have to marry the builder and agree to his disgusting demands. Loki pleaded with the gods to spare his life and promised to find a solution. Loki was never short of ideas and tricks, so he came up with another plan. The following night, 
he took the appearance of a mare, and when the horse went for more stones, as usual, he showed himself as the mare. The horse was aroused by this welcome distraction, and instantly forgot to collect the stones. Instead, it ran after Loki in disguise. Loki, as the mare, ran all night, and all night the builder's horse tried to catch him. When morning came, the horse was still missing, and the builder understood that, without stones, he would now be unable to finish the wall in time. The gods were delighted to see how Loki had reversed the situation, but it didn't make them gracious. Their anger of almost having been played turned against the builder. Instead of wages for his work, they deemed justified a punishment for the builder who had almost earned the sun, the moon, and Freya's hand. Thor gave him a fatal blow from his hammer, and the builder was no more. But the gods were not the only winners here, because far from the wall, in the forest, the horse had finally caught up with the mare, and could finally achieve his goals with poor Loki. Of this unexpected union, an eight-legged horse soon saw the light of day, the horse Sleipnir, that would become Odin's mount. Now, let's resume our exploration of the Nine Worlds and talk about Midgard. Midgard was created by the gods. They slew a giant called Ymir and they created the various parts of the world from its body parts, including a fence that they made from Emir's eyebrows. It sounds rather bizarre, and in fact, in many Norse myths, the proportions are quite surprising. They didn't have a monopoly on this, for example, in Greek mythology, one anecdote was that all the stars we see at night, the entire Milky Way, was actually breast milk spilled by a goddess Hera when she fed the young Hercules. It didn't sound very realistic either, and we will see later with the Norse myth of creation that it was not at all about realism or accurate proportions. This didn't really matter because, as myth, they were a kind of poetry, and they had uh, metaphorical functions or symbolic functions. Realism was not the point. Also, the vision that the Vikings had of their world and their society was quite far from the Western European perception of them in the Middle Ages. They were seen as uncivilized warriors and looters. The ancestors of the Vikings had stayed at a distance from the Roman Empire. There was a mutual awareness, but Scandinavia was way too far for the Romans to think about conquest, and they already had a hard time containing the Germans. Also, the Vikings were never a single kingdom. They were a collection of tribes, clans, and smaller kingdoms, forming an ethnic and cultural area in what is now Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Iceland. When they really made an entrance on the European scene in the 8th century, it was indeed to make raids and attack, without warning, any town or monastery or ship they could loot. So in Western European chronicles and uh, later historiography, they were depicted as barbarians, violent and uncivilized. All the more that they were pagans, 
and the regions they attacked had been Christianized. But the Vikings were not just warriors, they were also traders, explorers. They went on to explore well beyond Western Europe. The ones from Sweden looked towards Russia, and they went all the way south to the Byzantine Empire. They crossed the Atlantic. They reached North Africa in Rez. They obviously practiced agriculture, and their society had all the characteristics of civilization. It had an order, sedentary settlements, an elaborate society with rules, traditions, laws. They were not inherently chaotic, far from that. And the myth of Midgard as this intermediate world populated by humans reflects this perception of humanity and their society. Midgard was located between the opposite poles of order and chaos, but protected by the gods and invited to get more civilized, more orderly. This shows their conscience or their understanding that the model to tend to for human societies was one of order and stability like Asgard, not the wilderness and chaos epitomized by Jotunheim, even though these aspects were also part of our imperfect world. So Jotunheim was a third world under or around Midgard. This was not explicit, and it was described as an inhospitable expanse covered in dark forests and mountain peaks gripped in a never-ending winter that only wild beasts populated. But Jotunheim was also the dwelling of the giants. Giant is a translation of the term Jotun and one that can be misleading because giant in English evokes a being of enormous size. This was not what a Jotun was. The Old Norse word Jotun comes from Proto-Germanic and it means devourer. So to the ancient Norse, there was no notion of a huge size in the term Jotun, but like the titans of Greek mythology, the giants of Norse mythology were powerful creatures, enemies of the gods. You remember I told you about these concepts of Inangard, what is orderly and law-abiding, and Utangard, what is chaotic and wild. The giants are the personification of the Utangard. The Aesir gods from Asgard were the protectors of civilization, and despite their personalities and personal flaws, which were real, they tried to elevate humans, make their societies more prosperous, more orderly, more cultured. The devourers did the opposite. They were constantly trying to drag humans back to primordial chaos. They were forces of destruction or of decay. The opposition between Aesir gods and giants or Jotner, Jotun in the plural, is not really good versus evil, it is rather order versus chaos, or civilized versus wild. This is a big difference between ancient pantheons and later monotheist religions or traditions. In monotheist religions, the single god is almighty, knows everything, created the world and its inhabitants, and is literally perfection. God is perfectly good. On the opposite, the devil is a representation or an incarnation of evil. Gods from ancient pantheons were not that powerful, and they were never perfect. 
They were not the creators of the cosmos either. They had been created with it. And even though they were eternal and incomparably more powerful than humans, their power had limitations. They could not know everything. They had to fight. They made mistakes. They had distinct personalities and sometimes even their rule was not eternal. We will see that later with Ragnarok at the end. Specifically in the Norse pantheon, the giants were not intrinsically evil. They just followed their destructive nature. And occasionally they could even play a useful role, even though inadvertently. The Aesir gods and the giants were not even entirely different creatures. Odin was half-giant, and the gods didn't seek to destroy the giants, but rather to keep them in check so that a balance would be preserved. So let's keep exploring the Nine Worlds after these three ones, Asgard, Midgard, and Jotunheim. The fourth world was Vanaheim, the home of another tribe of deities, the Vanir. These gods are like a lost continent of Norse mythology, because the sources are very fragmentary, so we don't exactly know what their importance was to the Norse. Some of them may have been among the most widely worshipped across the Viking world, but to us they look eclipsed by Aesir gods. There is no known description of Vanaheim either. It is vaguely pictured as a place wilder than Asgard, where the forces of nature dominate but it doesn't really inform us of the precise vision that the Norse had of this world. Among famous Vanir gods are three figures that are better known because they joined the Aesir in Asgard after a war between the two tribes. There was Njord, a god associated with wealth and seafaring, that seems to have been very well known and venerated by the Vikings. There was also his daughter, Freya. We talked about her in a previous story. And his son, Freya. The two also became honorary members of the Aesir tribe. Freya was famous for her fondness of love, beauty and fine material possessions. If we were to make comparisons with other pantheons, she would be the figure closer to Venus for the Romans and Aphrodite for the Greeks. It is widely believed that Freya and another goddess, Frigg, Odin's wife, were actually the same figure for most of Norse history. In later sources from the Middle Ages, they are distinguished with two different goddesses, but they share so many similarities that it could just be a misunderstanding by the authors who put Norse mythology in writing after the Christianization of Scandinavia, because their storylines and personalities seem similar enough to consider them the same deity. The third Vanir to join the Aesir was Freya's brother, Freya. Yet another divinity that was widely venerated and well liked because he was associated with peace, good health and fertility, both agricultural for harvests and sexual. His blessing was called on weddings and in the celebration of harvests. But why did Njord and his two children end up in Asgard and became honorary Aesir gods? Because they were taken as hostages after a war. And this is another story I have to tell you. The war between the Aesir and the Vanir. 
when our story began, Freya was still living with her tribe, the Vanir, and she was the most powerful practitioner of magic in the entire Nine Worlds. She practiced Seder, a form of magic that gave her the power to discern the course of fate, and also to work on the structure of fate to bring about change. In other words, Freya could interfere in destinies, and her services were passionately sought after. So she traveled from town to town and from world to world, where people would hire her for her craft. She eventually visited Asgard, the home of the Aesir. The Aesir gods were impressed with her talent and sought her services. So much so that soon it became almost an obsession for them. Their selfish desires that they wished to fulfill with the help of the magician were becoming more important than anything else. And the rules of honor, loyalty and obedience to the law that characterized the Aesir were pushed aside. Realizing that, they didn't blame themselves for their own shortcomings, this was not their way of dealing with problems, they blamed Freya. They conspired to murder her and return to their previous life once she would have disappeared. Three times they tried to burn her, but she was a powerful goddess too and three times she was reborn from the ashes. When the Vanir learned what had been done, or at least attempted against one of their own, they became hostile to the Aesir, and soon the hostility between the two tribes erupted into war. They began fighting. The Aesir with physical strength and the rules of combat the Vanir through magic, which was their way. The war remained indecisive for a long time. Each side gained the upper end in turns, but neither the magic of the Vanir, nor the strength of Thor or the tricks of Odin and Loki could put an end to it. Eventually, the two tribes had enough of this fighting and agreed to call a truce. This is when they exchanged hostages that would live with the other tribe as a guarantee of peace, as was customary between tribes that had been at war. Njord and his children, Freya and Freyr, joined the Aesir. The Vanir welcomed two members of the Aesir, Hynir, a god of great strength that presided over frenzy on the battlefields, but of limited intelligence, he was often at a loss for words. And Mimir, the same Mimir who had gained incomparable wisdom thanks to the magic water and that Odin had visited and offered an eye to in order to broaden his knowledge in our first story. The Vanir were well versed into the magic arts but it didn't mean they were that smart. They observed that Hynir was able to give advice of extraordinary wisdom and value, and they began to regularly ask for his insight on everything. What they didn't realize was that Hynir was visionary and articulate only in the presence of Mimir, who was the real source of wisdom. As time passed, they kept asking Hynir for advice on any problem. But as he was not always in the company of Mimir, he also gave pointless and unhelpful answers. Vanir grew angry at his stupidity and felt cheated in the exchange of hostages. So, as retribution, they beheaded Mimir the very source of wisdom they could have used to their advantage, 
and they sent his head back to Asgard. Odin was quite sad of the loss of his old friend, but this didn't restart the war. Instead, Odin emboldened the head and revived it with magic spells, so that the preserved head of Mimir would continue to give him advice in times of need. Now let's resume our exploration of the Nine Worlds with the fifth and the sixth ones. Niflheim, the world of fog, ice and darkness, and Muspelheim, the world of fire and heat. These two were cosmological opposites, and they played an important role in the creation of our world and all living beings. This is yet another story. The birth of the giant Ymir, the ancestor to all the giants and also the gods. How did it all begin? Before there was any living creature, or even plants, soil or sky, there was only a gaping abyss, an expanse of darkness and void that existed between Niflheim, the homeland of ice, and Muspelheim, the homeland of fire. This lasted eons that no one existed to record. But it happened that frost from Niflheim and flames from Muspelheim crept towards each other and met in the middle of the abyss. The meeting of these elemental principles set the creation of the world in motion. The fire melted the ice, and the drops formed themselves into Ymir, the first giant. Ymir was a gigantic creature, and was hermaphrodite. It could reproduce without anyone else. When he slept in the void of the abyss, that now had its first resident, other giants appeared, all born from Ymir's body. As the frost continued to melt, a second creature was born from the drops, a cow. She nourished Ymir with her milk, and nourished herself by licking the ice that contained salt. Her licks slowly uncovered another creature that was prisoner of the ice. Buri, Odin's grandfather, and the first of the Aesir gods. Buri had a son, who married a female giant, a daughter of Ymir, the primordial giant. And together they had three children, Odin and his two brothers, all half-giant and half-god. Odin and his brothers slew Ymir, and from his corpse they constructed the world. They formed oceans from his blood, soil from his skin, vegetation from his hair, the sky from his skull, and on this new world the first spring began. Some time later, the gods formed the first man and the first woman from tree trunks, and humanity began to multiply. But many giants had appeared from Ymir's body before the first giant died. Giants had multiplied, and their chaotic nature threatened to destroy this new world, Midgard. So in order to protect it, the gods built a fence around it, using Ymir's eyebrows, so that this new world would thrive, at least for now, because everything that begins needs to end, and the end of times would eventually happen. We will see that later. So we have seen six worlds 
at this point, Asgard, Midgard, Jotunheim, Vanheim, Niflheim, and Muspelheim. There are three left. Two others were home to extraordinary creatures. Alfheim, the world inhabited by the elves, demigod-like beings. The elves were luminous and described as more beautiful than the sun. There are no known descriptions of their homeland, but it can be imagined as full of light and beauty. Alfheim contrasted with Nidavellir, or Svartalfheim, the subterranean world of the dwarves, as much as the elves lived above ground, in luminous places. The dwarves were master smiths and master craftsmen, dwelling beneath the ground, in a labyrinth of mines and forges. And finally, the ninth world, the underworld, was Hel or Helheim, the realm of the fierce goddess Hel that reigned on it. Hel was thought to be located underground, like graves, but the name and the location should not make us conclude that it was a place of torment, like the Christian concept of Hel. The similarity in names is not a coincidence. Hell, H-E-L, and the modern English word Hell have the same root in the Proto-Germanic language, which is an ancestor of Old Norse and Old English. The original meaning is believed to have meant hidden or concealed, and it was used to qualify the underworld. It is likely that when Christian missionaries spread Christianity to the Anglo-Saxons, they used the closest word they could find in Old English to refer to Satan's realm, and the same term came to name the Christian hell in English. But apart from the similarity in name and the fact that it could be located underground in both traditions, the two concepts are very different. In Norse religion, hell was not a world where people ended up after death as a form of punishment. It was generally cast in neutral terms, as a place where people kept living on the other side of death, doing the same kind of things, eating, drinking, sleeping, fighting. All these worlds, their functions, their locations, or their history, appear in the various sources that give us access to Norse mythology. But the sources may be conflicting. They came from different places and periods, like old mythology. Norse mythology was not set in stone, and it evolved over time. So what are the sources we have at our disposal? There are several and the most complete and central to our modern knowledge are texts from Iceland called the Edders. First, there is a collection of poems known as the Poetic Edda that is incomparably precious because they expose the old Norse cosmology and mythology in a systematic way. The authors are unknown and the period uncertain, but they were composed sometime between the 10th and 13th centuries, at the time when Scandinavia and Iceland were being Christianized, but old Norse beliefs still circulated and resisted the religious shift. There is also a treatise called the Prose Edda from the 13th century by an Icelandic scholar, Snorri Sturluson. It is also a rich source of information, but it is post-Christian 
and the experts believe that many interpretations and tales from the prose Edda bear the trace of the new world that had begun. Also from Iceland in the Middle Ages are several historical texts called the sagas. They may contain real elements, but they are not historical in the modern sense. They mix real events with legends and mythological references, so they also are a source. On top of these documents, there are also medieval compilations of mythological stories from Denmark, from Germany, like the Nibelungenlied, and sometimes old Anglo-Saxon literature helps corroborate other sources. For example, Beowulf, the epic poem, is a valuable source here. Apart from writings, archaeology is an important non-literary source. Of course, archaeological finds do not tell the stories by themselves, but they corroborate texts with the iconography or the ancient naming of places. I already told you about several gods of the Norse pantheon, Odin, his wife Freya or Frigg, her brother Freya. So now let's look at some other prominent Norse gods, only a few ones because there are actually dozens of characters and many tales I could tell you about in another story, or two or three, because I had to leave aside a lot of possible stories for tonight. So obviously you know about another famous Norse god called Thor. Thor was the archetype of the warrior god the ideal toward which human warriors should aspire, courageous, with a strong sense of duty, and very powerful, even more with his magic belt of strength and his hammer. In many episodes, he fights the Jotnir, the giants, defends Asgard, and protects humanity. He also fights monsters, especially an enormous sea serpent called Jormungand, so big that it encircles Midgard. Ironically, Thor was the ultimate protection against the Jotun, but he was three-quarters Jotun himself. His father, Odin, was half Jotun, as we saw before, and his mother was of full giant ancestry. Another prominent girl is Loki, and Loki was a very ambivalent figure. His father was a giant, not a god, and he was more than anything known for his tricks and a lack of concern for the well-being of other gods. He was unreliable and often painted as a villain with no consideration for social expectations or his reputation. He was also a coward, focused on self-preservation. And even when he was useful, because several times he saved the day, as we have seen in the story about the wall of Asgard, it was always because he was forced to. Even what we could call the laws of nature didn't apply to him. He fathered monsters, such as the giant serpent, Jormungand, the enemy of Thor, and turned into a mother when he shapeshifted into a mare. At the end of times, Ragnarok, that I kept for the end of the story, he turned against the gods and sided with the giants. So, in a sense, he is a god because he resides in Asgard and interacts with them. He has formidable powers, but he also embodied the opposite to traditional Norse values like honor, honesty and courage. And no traces of any kind of worship of Loki has 
ever been found in historical records. People who lived on the margin of society acted as tricksters or saw themselves as smarter than average would have claimed the patronage of Odin not lucky because it was not desirable at all. There were more figures, Balder, a handsome and cheerful god who was loved by all creatures, a kind of northern Apollo. Heimdall, the god tasked with guarding the god's stronghold in Asgard. His dwelling sat on top of a rainbow bridge that led to Asgard, the Bifrost. Tyr, another war god that presided over matters of law and justice, and many more with an obscure role because we lack sources, like Eden, Bragi, Sif. Prominent giants were also famous. Different tales give names and information about some of them. But as I said earlier, this colorful world, full of mysteries, magic, creatures embodying all concepts or feelings imaginable, this world that was born from the meeting of fire and ice at the dawn of times, was doomed to disappear. It is now time for the last story of the night, the story of Ragnarok. Ragnarok, in Old Norse it meant fate of the gods, was the destruction of the cosmos and everything in it, including the gods, the giants, the different worlds and their inhabitants, was or will be, because Ragnarok is the last possible tale of Norse mythology, but to the Vikings it was a prophecy a disaster waiting to happen, even though the precise story of this cataclysmic destruction was already written. So I'll tell it in the future tense. You remember the Norns we discovered at the beginning, the three maidens who decided the fates of gods and humans. One day, they will decree that a great winter shall come. The light and warmth of the sun will fade, plunging the world into darkness and a cold like no living creature has ever experienced. Around the world, biting winds and snowstorms will add to the devastation. This terrible winter shall last for the equivalent of three winters, without respite, and during this very long month, plants will die, harvests will be lost, and animals in the forests and the seas will die in large numbers, making food harder and harder to find. Mankind will be so desperate that all laws and codes of conduct will collapse, leaving only a cruel and hopeless struggle for survival. It will be an age of wars, when tribes will explode, brothers will slay their brothers, and fathers will slay their sons. In the skies, the sun and the moon will fully disappear, and so will the stars, leaving only a black void above the heads of the survivors. Monsters will get free or awaken, such as a monstrous wolf called Fenrir, or Jormungand, the giant serpent. Waters from the oceans will be spilled over the land by the convulsions of the serpent, and floating on these floods, a sinister ship will travel with an army of giants, led by no other than Loki, the traitor god. 
the dome of the sky made millennia ago from the skull of the primordial giant Ymir will be split and from the crack fire giants from Muspelheim will emerge. These fire giants will attack Asgard marching across the Bifrost the rainbow that connects Asgard to Midgard and the Bifrost will collapse behind them. Heimdall, the guardian, will blow his horn to announce the arrival of the moment all gods have feared for their entire existence. The gods will know in advance that everything is lost and that this battle shall be their last. But when everything is lost, honor can still be saved, so they will decide to go to battle against the giants and the monsters. Odin will be joined by the champions of men, an army of heroes chosen by him over the centuries for their bravery and strength. And together they will confront the giant wolf, Fenrir. They will collectively fight more valiantly than any god or any man ever fought, but they will lose and be swallowed by Fenrir, the only survivor, one of Odin's sons, burning with rage, will be able to avenge his father and kill the wolf. Other duels will also end in the death of both sides. The god Tyr will slay another monstrous wolf, but be killed by it. Heimdall will face Loki, and both will fall. So will Freya and the chief of the fire giants, and Thor and the serpent Jormungand, leaving no survivors on the battlefield. Then, when the last god and the last Jotun will have expired, the remains of the world will sink into the sea. The waters will cover everything and the waters themselves will dissipate, leaving only a void. Creation and all that had occurred since will be completely undone, as if nothing had happened. Was it all just a dream, after all? Maybe, according to some, another world will arise. Maybe the waters will not disappear but recede and another world will be repopulated by a few survivors. Or, one day, if the void replaces everything, maybe the frost from Niflheim and the flames from Muspelheim will meet and everything shall start again. Please gather round in my study, close to the fireplace, because I have a long story and extraordinary epic to tell you tonight. The Aeneid, the Roman equivalent to the Iliad and Odyssey, that will take us from the ruins of Troy, conquered and destroyed by the Greeks, to the foundation of the Antiquities' greatest empire by a group of Trojan fugitives led by Aeneas. There will be adventure, love, God's interventions, fights, prophecies, and even a journey to the underworld. I will also tell you about the author of the Aeneid the structure and posterity of this work, as well as its cultural and political significance. But let's begin immediately with the first chapter of our story, one that will take us to Troy 
at the moment when the Trojans thought they had won their ten-year-long war against the Greeks. But in reality, they were in great danger of losing everything. Let's light a fire as we get on with our story. You know the Trojan War, as it was told in the Iliad and the Odyssey. All the kings and cities from Greece, the Achaeans, gathered to attack the powerful city of Troy on the other side of the Aegean Sea. But Troy was well protected behind its walls. It was defended by heroes and even supported by some of the gods, like Poseidon, Neptune to the Romans, Aphrodite, Venus, or Apollo. The Trojans resisted. It seemed the city would never fall, as the Greeks could not force its fortifications, and the attackers were losing patience threatening their coalition after ten years of fruitless attacks on Troy. Until King Odysseus, Ulysses, came up with a plan. The Greeks built a large statue of a horse on wheels. And suddenly, overnight, they abandoned the beach under the city's walls. War, so it seemed. Only one man stayed on the beach as the Greeks pretended to sail away. Sinon, one of their warriors. His mission was to convince the Trojans that the Achaeans had abandoned the fight and that they had won the war. And also that the horse was an offering to Neptune the god of the seas and also the master of horses. But this was obviously a trap. The horse was empty, and inside it were King Ulysses and a group of warriors, hidden, waiting for the Trojans to drag the horse behind their walls. The Trojans hesitated. The Greeks were nowhere to be seen, and what risk was there to accept a wooden statue, a gift to one of their protector gods? Sinon could convince them that accepting it would grant them the favors of Neptune, and that they would be able to conquer Greece if they did. But after ten years of merciless war, the Trojans had their doubts, especially a priest of Apollo, Laocoon, who saw through the Greek plot and urged his compatriots to destroy the horse immediately. As he was hurling his spear at the horse, two serpents sent by the gods suddenly emerged from the sea and devoured him which the Trojans saw as punishment for disrespecting the offering to Neptune. In fact, the gods had sent the snakes, but not to help the Trojans. They had decided that Troy shall fall, and this required the Greek plot to succeed. Impressed by this divine intervention, the Trojans dragged the statue behind their fortified walls and they began to organize festivities to celebrate their victory. After nightfall, as the Trojans were oblivious of threats as they thought nothing could happen behind their walls, the armed Greeks emerged from the wooden statue where they had remained hidden all day and they opened the city's gates. In silence, the Greek army had returned, 
and now stood ready to enter the defenseless city. As these events were unfolding, one of the Trojan princes and heroes, Aeneas, was sleeping at his house. Aeneas was of the highest Trojan nobility. His father, Anchises, was a prince of Troy, and his mother was goddess Venus herself, who always loved and protected her son. Aeneas had fought bravely all along the war, and protected by his fighting skills and his godly mother, he had survived. That night, as the Greeks were starting to invade the city and slaughter the Trojan guards, the Trojan hero Hector appeared to him in a dream. Hector had died recently by the hand of Greece's most formidable hero, Achilles. And in this dream, Hector's ghost urged Aeneas to immediately flee the city with his family. The gods had made plans, as they used to, and they had decided that Troy would fall. But in the negotiations between them, Venus had obtained protection and a future for her son. A future actually so brilliant and extraordinary that the name of Aeneas would stay immortal and his deeds would be celebrated for centuries like the ones of Hector, Ulysses or Achilles. But for this fate to happen, Aeneas needed to escape the destruction of the city. At first, he refused and tried to fight the enemy. But the cause was lost, and Trojan warriors were falling, one after the other, as more and more columns of fire and smoke rose from the city. Aeneas witnessed the murder of Priam, the old king of Troy, by Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, and he accepted that the war was lost. Ulysses' plan had worked, and trickery had defeated honor. Venus appeared to her son, and led him back to his house, where his son, Ascanius, his wife, Creusa, and his father, Anchises, were anxiously waiting. They all accepted to try to escape and discreetly took the direction of the city's gates through the chaos that Troy had become. When they reached the open gates, Aeneas realized that Creusa was no longer with them, and he went back into the city to look for her. But he only encountered her ghost and understood that she had perished. The ghost of his wife, inspired by the gods, told him that he should follow his destiny. He would travel to Hesperia, the western land, go through struggles, temptation and perils, but ultimately kingship and a new royal spouse awaited him there. Desperate, Almost broken by the cruelty of life and the gods, Aeneas was close to renounce to his own life after losing his city and his wife. But his son had survived, his father too, and with the inspiration from his divine mother, he found the strength to rally a few other survivors and flee from the burning city. The world was ending. 
the Greeks were now celebrating their triumph, that the survival of Aeneas and his companions were the seeds of a new empire, one that, by the will of the gods, would surpass anything the Trojans or even the Greeks could ever have imagined. In many generations, the creation of Rome and its extraordinary destiny would be the phoenix rising from the ashes of Troy. After their escape from Troy, the survivors hastily built a fleet of ships and decided to accompany their new leader, Aeneas, on his travel to the western end. Even though they were a small group of refugees, the gods were closely looking at them. On their side were the protectors of Troy, like Neptune, Venus, and Apollo. Others were neutral or even hostile, like Juno, Hera to the Greeks, the queen of gods and wife of Jupiter, Zeus, or Minerva, Athena, the traditional protector of Greek heroes such as Ulysses. Under the eyes of the gods, the expedition began wanderings across the Aegean and Mediterranean seas. To begin with, they landed in Thrace, near Troy, where they found the last remains of another Trojan warrior and hero, Polydorus. Then on the island of Delos, a holy sanctuary of Apollo and his twin sister, Diana, the patron goddess of hunters. Delos was welcoming and peaceful, and the group was tempted to stay there after the exhausting ordeal they had just gone through in Troy. But Apollo told them to leave, as it was not the place the gods intended them to colonize. So they resumed the journey and sailed south to Crete, where they thought they had arrived to their destination. And so they started building a settlement, a future city. But as soon as they began to build it, they were struck with disease. Apollo appeared to Aeneas in a dream and told him that this was the wrong place. This was not the western land of Italy and they should leave Crete immediately to resume their journey. Left with no other choice, they abandoned the settlement and sailed away from Crete to the west. On their next stop, in small islands west of Greece, they met a harpy, a monster, half bird and half woman, that occasionally feasted on human flesh, but also was wise enough to avoid attacking the protégé of Venus. She ordered them to leave her island immediately and made a prophecy for Aeneas. They would reach Italy one day in the future, but they wouldn't find it until hunger forced them to eat their own tables. And with this gloomy prophecy, they resumed their wanderings this time landing in Epirus, north of Greece. They were not the only survivors of Troy. Others had managed to escape and traveled to Epirus in today's northern Greece and Albania. There, another group of survivors from Troy had begun to build a city that replicated Troy, and they hoped that this city would give them a second home 
and cure their homesickness. In Epirus, Aeneas met Andromache, the widow of Hector. Andromache had also escaped Troy, and was still mourning the loss of her husband and their son. She had suffered as much or even more than most of the Trojans in the war. But despite all the pain, she had remained a model of fidelity and virtue. She was accompanied by Helenus, a son of King Priam of Troy, who had the gift of prophecy. And yet again, a prophecy was made. Helenus revealed that not only Aeneas' descendants would prosper in Italy, they would also rule the entire world. But Epirus was still not the promised land for them, and the group resumed their journey. As I mentioned before, not all gods who watched Aeneas' expedition were benevolent. Among their enemies was Juno, Hera in the Iliad and Greek mythology, the wife of Jupiter. Juno was against the Trojans and Venus because she had been humiliated long before. Before the Trojan War, three goddesses had appeared in front of Prince Paris of Troy and competed for his preference. And at this moment, the chain of events that later led to the complete destruction of Troy began. Paris had been tasked to choose which of the three goddesses should receive a golden apple gifted by the goddess of discord. This was a poisonous gift. The apple had been gifted to no one in particular. It came with just the instruction that it should be the property of the most deserving goddess. And three of them considered it should be theirs. Juno, Minerva and Venus. Paris had had to choose between them, and to seduce or convince him, each goddess promised extraordinary rewards, kingship and power for Juno, strength and glory for Minerva, or the love of the most beautiful woman in the world for Venus. Paris had chosen Venus over the two other ones because the highest reward a man could hope for was eternal and perfect love. And so he had been promised Helen, the Greek queen, that he took to Troy, prompting the beginning of the war. Venus had sided with the Trojans whereas Juno and Minerva were on the Greek side for these reasons. To most, the death of Paris and the complete destruction of Troy would have been enough of her vengeance, but not to Juno, who was able to hold grudges for a very long time and had never been very good at forgiving anything from the judgment of Paris to the infidelities of her husband. And so, after all these years, Juno was still angry and jealous at Venus, and kept plotting against the Trojans. Another reason to stop them, that appeared when the gods had accepted that Aeneas and his companions would travel westward and lay the foundations of Rome, is that it was said that one day 
Rome would be the rival and destroyer of the city of Carthage, Juno's favorite city. And for that reason, she saw the prophecies in favor of Aeneas with even more displeasure. And so she had decided they would never reach Italy, never found a new city, and she would get her true revenge against Venus. The moment for her to strike was approaching. The expedition had come closer to Italy, but wasn't there yet. They were approaching Sicily, the large island to the south of Italy. There they went through other adventures near Sicily, like Ulysses nearly at the same time. They were caught in the whirlpool of Charybdis, a particularly dangerous place where boats were taken in a strait between an immensely powerful whirlpool, Charybdis, and a sea monster, Scylla. As a result, they were driven out to sea and traveled away from Italy, only to come ashore at the land of the Cyclops, giant one-eyed creatures that were as stupid and mean as they were strong. They narrowly escaped Polyphemus, a Cyclops that Ulysses had wounded and tricked shortly before on his own trip back to his kingdom. And after that, Aeneas' father, Anchises, died of old age, and the fleet was suddenly taken into an unexpected storm. Juno had chosen this moment to finally unleash her wrath. Juno had no power over the seas and the winds, and so she had approached Aeolus, the king of the winds, and asked that he released the winds to stir up a storm. Aeolus had no reason to obey her and take sides between the gods, so she had to offer him a bribe. Juno reigned over several lovely sea nymphs and offered the loveliest of them as a wife to Aeolus. The king of winds found the prize sufficient and accepted the offer. Soon, the fleet of Aeneas that was trying to sail back towards Italy saw black clouds form above their heads. Winds began to blow chaotically from every direction and the storm devastated and scattered the fleet. The Trojans were saved only by the intervention of Neptune. The god of the seas had been infuriated by Juno's intrusion into his domain, and he calmed the waters to save the desperate fleet from sinking. The ships could regroup and take shelter on the coast of Africa near a recently founded city, where a powerful queen reigned. The city was Carthage, and its queen was called Dido. You remember that prophecies had been made. Carthage would later become a great imperial rival and enemy to Rome. But who could have believed that, when Carthage had just been founded by a group of Phoenicians who had created this settlement far from their homeland in the east of the Mediterranean. And Rome did not even exist yet. After a while, and as the crews were repairing the ships and looking for food, Aeneas decided to venture into the city of Carthage. He knew that Juno was the patroness of Carthage. She had a temple there, 
and he hoped he could appease her by showing his devotion. In the temple of Juno, he met for the first time the Queen of Carthage, the lovely Dido, and at first sight he liked her, if not more, and seeked her favors. The memory of Creusa, his lost wife from Troy, had not entirely faded away yet, but after so much loneliness, the beauty and grace of Dido had awakened a flame in him, which he thought had entirely disappeared forever. Dido was a widow, too, and she was not insensitive to the looks and bravery of the Trojan warrior. Venus knew that the expedition needed respite before resuming its journey. And what better protection and help than uh, the Queen of Carthage's? So she once again called her son, Cupid, the little god who could inspire love in humans, like she had called him years before to make Helen fall for Paris. Cupid took the appearance of the son of Aeneas, who was part of the expedition, Ascanius. Disguised as Ascanius, he went to Dido with gifts, and Dido responded with a banquet given in honor of her Trojan visitors. During the banquet, Cupid secretly inspired fresh love for Aeneas in the heart of Dido. The threads of a tragedy were coming together. The two were attracted to each other, but separated by prophecies that pitied the young Carthage against the future Rome. How would the other gods react to this impossible love? We will see soon how events unfolded, but before that, Let's take a look at the Aeneid and its author, Virgil. What is this work about? It was written over a period of ten years, at the turn of our era, between 29 and 19 BC, when Rome had already begun its impressive expansion as a military cultural and political great power. Politically, there was also a transition from the old republic to an increasingly imperial system in which the institutions of the ancient republic officially stayed in place, but supreme power was moving into the hands of hereditary emperors. At the time when the Aeneid was written, the new emperor was Augustus, successor of Julius Caesar, the one who defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, and all his other rivals too, to concentrate all power in his hands. Years of civil war, the fall of the Republic in all but name, and the devastation this had caused had uh, torn through society. People were craving stability, and maybe their faith in the greatness of Rome had been uh, put into doubt, eroded, because Rome was no stranger to civil wars, but its republican tradition was very ancient and historically successful. If you are interested in this political and historical aspect, I'll put a link to the three-hour story about the history of Rome in the description. Augustus was well aware of this, and he wanted to consolidate his power and restore pride and traditional Roman values 
as a, a way of giving a sense of continuity and political unity behind him, of course. The Aeneid was written and sponsored by the highest authorities in Rome, with all that in mind. It was not the only reason, it is a work in its own right, but from the start it was seen as serving a purpose. For a part it was propaganda, even though the premise is that it tells the story of the founding of Rome, it was never presented as a history book at all. The Romans were well aware that it was myth being forged, being fabricated. But it doesn't mean it was not efficient. By turning a hero with high moral values into the founder of Rome, and even linking him to the ruling dynasty, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. We will see that later. Virgil hoped to create a remarkable work, but also to galvanize his readers, to re-inject a sense of greatness, of epic, of duration, in the mythology of Rome. A well-known and actually older story about the founding of Rome is the story of Remus and Romulus. And Virgil does not eliminate them. He integrates this anecdote into the epic together with numerous pre-existing characters and tales from the Greek and Roman traditions. Because, obviously, Greek culture was very important to the Romans, not just the literature with works like the Iliad and the Odyssey that they knew perfectly. The religion, architecture, language, logic, philosophy, the way of looking at the world, all of this was well known and part of the cultural baggage of educated Roman citizens. They had ambivalent feelings towards Greece. There was a great deal of admiration and acceptation of this cultural heritage, but also a sense of being different and somewhat more successful as a civilization. It was Rome, not Greece, that had conquered the entire Mediterranean world. And at the end of the first century BC, pretty much all the uh, ancient Greek world and a large part of the empire of Alexander the Great was already under Roman administration. The Aeneid reflects all this. It is clearly strongly inspired by the works of Homer, full of references to Greece, and yet the ancestors of the Romans in the story are the Trojans, the enemies of the Greeks, that finally got their revenge many centuries later. This was a characteristic of the Romans. They often glorified their enemies, the kingdoms they conquered, because obviously the fact that they had prevailed could only improve their own sense of greatness. They did it with Carthage and their successive opponents along their expansion. But the Aeneid is more than a propaganda work. It is also a massive piece of storytelling and poetry. It comprises almost 10,000 lines and even though today it is somewhat less famous than the Iliad and the Odyssey, you don't see that many movies or TV shows directly inspired by the Aeneid, for example, and the characters are probably less famous. But it was not always the case. Until the modern period, the Aeneid was at the center of scholarly culture 
and it was seen as a masterpiece of antique literature in the Middle Ages and the early modern times. Probably the most important original work in Latin. It was to uh, Latin what the Odyssey was to Greek. And the story itself was still well known and told to uh, pupils until the 19th century. A lot of elements from the antiquity were reintegrated into Western culture along the centuries in uh, novels or plays or operas and the Aeneid kept being told through this. Just if we look at operas, one of the most famous pieces by uh, Henry Purcell, the English Baroque composer, is Dido and Aeneas, or there is a 19th century opera by uh, Hector Berlioz called uh, Les Troyens, the Trojans, which retells the story of the Aeneid. Now, the chronology of the work is not exactly as I'm retelling you the story. Another thing that Virgil took from the Greeks, from Homer, is the structure. It is not chronological, but it begins in the middle of events, in medias res, in Latin, and then we learn of past events through flashbacks, when characters tell their stories to others. It was the case in the Odyssey, for example. It begins by the end, or almost the end, when Ulysses' son, Telemachus, is looking for information about what happened to his father since he left the siege of Troy years before. And then we learn what happened to him until the end when it comes back to the present and Ulysses reconquers his kingdom and his wife. It makes the story more dynamic and when it was told rather than read in the antiquity it must have made it even more captivating to the audience. But maybe an unfortunate consequence, though, is that when you read the Odyssey nowadays, you have to start with arguably the least interesting part of it, or at least in terms of entertainment value. And this may have made uh, many generations of readers abandon the book before they reached the most entertaining part. In the Aeneid, Virgil solves that by starting at the point where Aeneas and his ships are taken in the storm created by Juno. Indirectly, she asked Aeolus to send the winds for her. So we are immediately thrown into the middle of action and then the Trojans land for repairs on the coast of Africa, near Carthage. They meet Dido, and Aeneas tells her everything that has happened to them since their escape from Troy. This is how we learn everything I just told you. After that, the story becomes linear again, and we follow Aeneas from Carthage to Italy and the struggle to lay the basis of Rome. There are 12 chapters or books in total in the Aeneid, and we have only gone through three of them. So let's resume the story because there is still a lot to discover. Dido and Aeneas had fallen in love in Carthage and Juno saw the opportunity to strike a deal with Venus. She would let Aeneas alone if he could stay with Dido. This way he would be distracted from his destiny of founding a city in Italy, and Rome would never exist, never rise, so that her city, Carthage, 
would not be destroyed. And Venus was inclined to accept because she cared for the happiness of her son. He had already suffered so much since the fall of Troy and she was willing to give him some respite at least. The Trojans liked their stay in Carthage. They were ready to go, but they stayed to enjoy Dido's hospitality, and their leader showed no hurry to leave. One day, on a hunting expedition, a storm drove Aeneas and Dido to a covered grove, where they made love for the first time and both were so happy to have found each other that they desired nothing else than get married and spend the rest of their days together. Venus and Juno observed this with satisfaction, but the other gods were displeased to see Aeneas forget the destiny they had decided for him. So Jupiter sent his messenger, Mercury, to remind the Trojan prince of his duty. And our hero was reminded of the tragic dilemma he was facing. Fulfilling his duty would be at the cost of his happiness and the happiness of the woman he loved. He hesitated. But Aeneas was not one to reject the call of duty or go against the gods, and unable to face his lover, he left clandestinely at night, his heart broken by the decision. Dido's heart was equally broken when she discovered it and life had lost all appeal to her. She committed suicide by stabbing herself upon a pyre with Aeneas' sword. Her last words were to predict eternal strife between Aeneas' people and hers. And so in the flames of the pyre, where her body was turning to ashes, Another prophecy started to be fulfilled. Rome and Carthage would forever be arch enemies, and only the destruction of Carthage would end this rivalry. Once again, men would be toys in the hands of the gods. But Aeneas had chosen duty over personal interest and had proven worthy of the destiny he had been assigned. The journey resumed. They sailed north and returned to Sicily, not far from where the storm sent by Aeolus on request from Juno had scattered their fleet months earlier. It was hard time to remember Anchises, Aeneas father, and funeral games were organized for the anniversary of his death. As the men were busy with sport competitions, Juno was still plotting. Her agreement with Venus had ended when Aeneas had left Carthage and Dido and now she would do anything she could to stop Aeneas from reaching Italy and found Rome. She sent her messenger, Iris, disguised as an old woman, to convince the Trojan women from the expedition to burn the fleet and this way prevent the Trojans from ever reaching Italy. But seeing that his ships were burning, Aeneas fell on his knees and prayed to Jupiter to quench the fires. The king of gods accepted and sent a rainstorm to save the fleet from complete destruction. 
but the gods don't do anything for free. In return for saving the fleet and for safe passage to Italy, Jupiter demanded one of Aeneas' men to be sacrificed to him. And shortly after, the helmsman of Aeneas' ship was claimed as the prize. He was put to sleep at night by the god of sleep, Somnus, and fell overboard. Jupiter had claimed his life. Before this, Aeneas had received a vision of his father, who had instructed him to go to the underworld where he would receive a vision of his future and Rome's future. Protected by Jupiter, the fleet had finally landed in Italy, near Cuma, a city close to Naples that did not exist yet. In this small city resided a powerful prophetess, a Sibyl, who presided over the oracle of Apollo. She could see glimpses of the future. She knew the ways of the gods, and she could travel to the underworld. Aeneas asked for guidance in the journey to the underworld he had to accomplish, and together they descended to the land of the dead. First, they passed by crowds of the dead, by the banks of the river Acheron. To continue their journey, the dead had to pay Charon, the ferryman, to access the other bank. The ones who couldn't pay him had to wait for a thousand years of loneliness and boredom before he would let them cross. But the Sibyl knew these lands and paid Charon, so they could swiftly cross and pass in front of Cerberus, the giant three-headed hound that guarded the underworld. Very few living ever visited the underworld and even fewer returned. But Aeneas had this privilege. First, he could see Tartarus, where the wicked are kept prisoner and suffer for eternity. The Sibyl warned him to always bow to the justice of the gods, if he didn't want to end there. And Aeneas was glad he had abandoned Carthage and follow the gods' orders until then. Then he was brought to the green fields of Elysium, where those who are wealthy can spend an eternity of joy and peace. He was happy to find the spirit of his father Anchises there, and he was offered a prophetic vision of the destiny of Rome. Not just a city, not a kingdom, but an universal empire destined to cover the entire world. After this, Aeneas and the Sibyl returned. Returned to the world of the living. Aeneas had found inspiration in the underworld. His expedition had reached Italy. And now it was time to found this new city that the gods had envisioned. Upon returning to our world, Aeneas led the Trojans to the north, to the region of Latium, where he decided they would settle. But the region was not empty. The kingdom dominating it, the kingdom of the Latins. At his head was King Latinus, and he had a daughter, Lavinia. Lavinia had been promised to Turnus, 
the ruler of another native people, the Rutuli. But before the Trojans arrived in Latium, Latinus had been sent oracles announcing the arrival of foreigners and instructing him to marry his daughter to the newcomers, not to Turnus. The gods had made preparations to facilitate the settlement of the Trojans. But Juno was still watching and was displeased with the Trojans' favorable situation. Aeneas was now close to peacefully accomplish his mission. So she summoned the fury, the deity of vengeance from the underworld, to stir up a war between the Trojans and the locals. The fury incited the queen of Latium, the wife of Latinus, to demand that her daughter Lavinia be married to Turnus of the Rutuli. And the fury also caused the son of Aeneas, Ascanius, to warn the sacred deer, sacred to the Rutuli, the ring a hunt. And the plan worked. Despite Aeneas' hopes of avoiding a war, Hostilities broke out between the Rutuli and the Trojans. A long and merciless war would ravage Latium. The Trojans were too few, and so Aeneas searched for allies. In a dream, he was encouraged to seek help from the Tuscans, enemies of the Rutuli and their king Turnus. The Tuscans accepted to fight alongside the Trojans, and so did a group of Greeks, the Arcadians, that Aeneas met at the place where Rome would one day be. But at the time, only seven hills dominated the landscape. The Rutuli also had allies of their own, especially Amazon warriors, fearless women devoted to Diana, who excelled at warfare, and their leader, Camilla. Venus was also looking after her son. She asked her husband, Vulcan, the god of craftsmen, to create weapons for Aeneas, and she gifted her beloved son with the weapons. Once again, Juno was throwing her weight in the balance. She discreetly informed Turnus, the enemy king, that Aeneas was away from his camp and that the moment was right to attack the Trojans. Turnus led an expedition to the camp. He could breach the gates but the Trojans had been toughened by years of adventures, and they could force the Rutuli king and his men to retreat. But this was only a skirmish. The real battle was coming, and it didn't take place only in Latium. In the realm of gods, Juno and Venus pleaded to Jupiter with passion for the right to intervene or have the gods settle the war in favor of their preferred side. Jupiter ruled that Aeneas and the Trojans had to once again prove their worth, and the goddesses had to watch events without further intervention. On the ground, Aeneas had returned to his camp with his Tuscan and Arcadian allies, and a large battle ensued. The battle lasted for a very long time. Prominent warriors fell on both sides, but it was inconclusive, and a temporary armistice, a truce, 
was agreed upon for each side to bury and honor their dead. As soon as the truce ended, the battle resumed, and soon the leader of the Amazons, Camilla, fell. But still the battle was undecided, and as a way to stop the bloodshed, a new truce and the idea of a single combat, a duel between Aeneas and Turnus, circulated. But Aeneas was individually so superior to Turnus that the Rutuli knew their king wouldn't stand a chance. So they broke the truce again. Finally, Aeneas could force Turnus into a single combat and the king of the Rutuli lost this fight. And this is the end, because the Aeneid was most probably left unfinished, some of the last lines are incomplete, and there is no proper conclusion, even though the text certainly ended near the conclusion that Virgil wished for. By winning his duel with Turnus, Aeneas granted victory to the Trojans and their allies, meaning that the way was now free for them to found their city in Latium, and on these foundations the Roman kingdom, republic and empire will flourish. Their descendants will include Romulus and Remus, and uh, cross the centuries to uh, form the patrician families of ancient Rome, such as the Gens Julia, the family of Julius Caesar, and Augustus, his adoptive son. The merger of Italic people with the Trojans will create the Romans, this new people called to inhabit and rule from the most extraordinary city ever built. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I will now let you enjoy the sweet sound of the crackling fire, and I'll talk to you soon with another story that this time will take us to mysteries hidden in Paris. But in the meantime, sleep well, sweet dreams. <laughs>